Good afternoon, and thank you to PIDSP for this invitation to discuss with you some updates on helminthic infections. I suppose acquiring helminthic infections is not the main theme of our, of our discussion this afternoon in the sense that we will focus more on updates. No? You, we know how these are acquired. There's very little that has changed in terms of acquiring helminthic infections. We will focus on updates. What, what are the latest in, te in terms of epidemiology, diagnosis, treatment, and control? So this is my proposed outline. And I'm um, given, I think, 30 minutes, 2.35, we'll finish at 3 or 3.05. I hope there will be time for some questions. I will talk about neglected tropical diseases and helminthic infections, zoom into updates on helminth infections in terms of epidemiology, diagnosis, and treatment. I would very much like to discuss with you preventive chemotherapy. I would like to hear more pediatric infectious disease, talk about it openly, and calmly, no? and, and, and that term not misunderstood by pediatricians themselves, and of course, updates on control. Last few minutes, we'll tackle some emerging helmet infections that are documented in children in the Philippines, and last but not least, possibly focus on your role in the control of neglected tropical diseases in this country. So the NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, are ancient diseases. They have actually burdened humanity since time immemorial, they are infectious diseases of poverty, and therefore PIDSP should be in discussions on neglected tropical diseases, very recently identified as targets of opportunity in the effort to improve, improve global health, and mainly because these are targeted for control, if not elimination, due to remarkable scientific breakthroughs, thanks to meaningful research, and now unprecedented corporate philanthropy. So many people wanting to talk about this in the global health arena. So many people wanting to support neglected tropical disease control in the global health arena, and why not here in the Philippines? And I hope to see PIDSP get involved in neglected tropical disease control, if not elimination. There are diseases of poverty causing enormous disability and suffering. This is well documented in the scientific literature. These infectious diseases pose um, risk and greater susceptibility to other often fatal diseases. On many occasions, patients may not die exactly of NTDs, but because they have been chronically infected with some of these diseases, these, these have predisposed them to poor states of health and actually complications that might cause their death. Over 50 million future, future years of disability-free loss. Now, this is a terminology being used in public health. Disability-adjusted life years. No? Increasing dallies and lowered quality of life no, for a lot of these people in the poorest countries. Endemic in over 100 of the poorest countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America most often with multiple diseases affecting any given community, and, and it is no exception in the Philippines, the Philippines is in na in. If there are top 100 corporations, top 100 taxpayers, there's also a top 100 countries for neglected tropical diseases, the Philippines belongs to that. So take a look at this map. The darker the, col the shade of the color, then you have more risk of getting these NTDs and higher burden of these NTDs. Notably, a lot of this occurring in Africa. The Philippines record talks about us being somewhere in between. And in fact, the literature talks about the Philippines having three major helmet infections. But based on our tally, it's more than three. And in fact, this afternoon, I'll talk more about more than three. So billions and billions of children and women and, and men at risk, more than 300 million people disabled, severely impaired, meaning they have not died, but their disabilities are actually uh, very, very obvious. Tremendous costs for medical treatment that drain resource scarce health systems. And high social and economic toll as physical incapacitation limits school attendance, no pediatricians. It is a freak, these are frequent causes of 
of absenteeism and poor school performance, and later on impairing work productivity. This has been costed by health economists at over 10 billion US dollars annually. And therefore, the, it is a must that the global health community talks about this. So here is, is a sampling of these negle neglected tropical diseases divided into the tool deficient, meaning we're not ready to eliminate. In fact, we have major problems with control. I have highlighted those that are present in the Philippines and close by, cysticercosis, occasionally we get referrals, for, even from pediatricians yourselves, we get the referrals of occasional cases of cysticercosis, echinococcosis, quite occasional, and in neighboring Vietnam, they have a, very, a quite high incidence of fasciolysis in central part of that country. We are thankful that we don't have the others in the list, if this disease is listed under this category, there is a lack of one or more of the components necessary to deliver effective mass drug administration at the community or school level. And therefore, what we have right now is to actually focus on diagnosis, early detection, requiring treatment that be, must be administered by highly trained professionals like yourselves in specialized facilities. WHO suggests strengthening primary care systems in endemic areas and offering inno innovative and intensified disease management. The second group of NTDs is actually our focus this afternoon. These are what we call the tool-ready neglected tropical diseases. And there's a bit of good news here. We talk about diseases like filariasis, schistosomiasis, soil transmitted helminth infections and trachoma, where control programs are equipped with efficient diagnostic, treatment, and follow-up surveillance strategies to implement mass drug administration campaigns. And now this is the focus of many of the global and United States government neglected tropical disease control efforts, including the Philippine government's neglected tropical disease control program. Focus on helminth infections, and as you notice, a significant number of the, the conditions enumerated in the previous slide will actually talk about helminth infections, where about 2 billion people are, are infected, primarily poor populations living in tropical and subtropical climates, NTDs, diseases of poverty related to unsafe water, poor sanitation, and impoverished living conditions, all associated with poverty, which actually is a target of the Philippine government nowadays. There's a huge poverty alleviation initiative being undertaken by government. In parasitology, there at UP, we talk about three Ps. And what are the three Ps? People, parasites, and poverty, they go together. You have high incidence of poverty, expect a lot of people having parasitic infections. And note, that with these parasitic infections, children remain most vulnerable, and therefore, it is of importance to be pediatricians like yourselves. The most common among these helminth infections happen to be the common worms, salt-transmitted helminth infections, your roundworms, whipworms, and hookworms, and unfortunately, schistosomiasis, which is still pretty much in our midst. Let's talk about common worms. They're, these are the most common infections affecting the poorest and most deprived communities. Billions of people worldwide, and of course you know how these are acquired. Open defecation is the key word. Open defecation actually allowing um, passage of infective material to the soil and actually people acquiring these infective stages from the soil. No, open defecation, and therefore, for as long as there is open defecation, the worms are going to keep on coming back. No? A heavily infected child, for instance, will pass out millions and millions of eggs per day. A heavily, ch heavily infected child with ascaris will pass out actually 10 million eggs per day. And when these 10 million eggs are laid openly, not in the sanitary toilet, on the soil, those eggs are viable for up to one to two years. And imagine the accumulation of infective material in areas where there is open defecation. While it is easiest to actually blame poor or dirt, 
poor or dirty surroundings, poor sanitation as the culprit, it's actually human behavior that has dirtied the environment. And therefore, these parasites that come from people actually infect other people. In other words, the conclusion is people infecting people. It's not the environment per se. And therefore, if there is a, a stop to open defecation, then possibly time comes when no, no more eggs can infect other people. The impact of these common worms are quite um, nicely described in the scientific literature where morbidities include growth stunting and malnutrition. Uso ba sa Pilipinas ang pandak? In Visayan, they say putot. Now you go to Visayas and Mindanao, it's not pandak, it's putot. Pag sinabi, uso ba putot? Yes, ang dami dito. Madaling, madaling tingnan yan. You go to church, and if you're not, if, and if you're uh, medium-sized in terms of height, then you, you, you will see you will see the priest so easily even if you're at the, at the back of the church because a lot of people are stunted. Yeah? Um, decreased physical activity. No? School teachers in the public schools, they talk about children who are sleepy early in the morning, children who, who lack alertness, children who actually fall asleep no? during class time, poor mental and physical development that affects school performance, all these are, the, are morbidities described related to soil transmitted helmet infections. Note that we do not like heavy intensity infections. And in fact, the control program's goal is to eliminate all heavy intensity infections, those who are passing roughly 10 million eggs per day. Because these heavily infected children actually have greater morbidity and complications that might include intestinal obstruction, iron deficiency anemia, dysentery syndromes, as well as their complications. So here is the map of the world showing the proportion of children 1 to 14 years of age, pediatric age group, in each country requiring preventive chemotherapy. Preventive chemotherapy is the mass drug administration I was talking about earlier for common worms. And notice, is the shading of the Philippines heavy or light? It's heavy. And again, we, it's unfortunate, no? The president, NEDA, Department of Finance, talks about a very nice economy. And then you talk about wormy children, we're still rich in wormy children in this country. So it does not jibe. No? Just a little bit about diagnosis. I know you work in hospitals and you have labs, you have clinics, you have your favorite labs you refer your patients to. Has it happened that you suspected patients having, were having worm infections and you, just, you ordered stool examination just the same, the results come back and say negative? It happens pretty, quite often. And we have documented the challenges that actually explain you know, such frustrating, um, uh, frustrating results of our uh, ordered laboratory tests. Among them, a lack of training of laboratory staff and quality control. People think that when medtechs graduate from medtech school, after having undergone one semester of parasitology, passing the, reg the medtech board, being an RMT, this person is fit to man a clinical laboratory. When these not so common parasites appear, they probably will not be reported or there will be some misdiagnosis. This has been documented here in the Philippines. There is a, a wide use of inappropriate stool examination techniques. The favorite stool examination technique is the wet smear. And if you recall, that is just a small, small speck of poo coming from the specimen submitted by the patient and the negative test result probably may not mean anything. Why? How much was examined? It was only one to two milligrams of feces. How much is one passage of feces in an average individual? It's roughly about 200 to 300 grams. Sometimes I ask the medical students, oh, how much feces does somebody pass out each time? What was taught to you in gastrointestinal tract physiology? Some of them would say, one kilo, two kilos. I said, no, that's probably the carabaos. So it's one to two milligrams, a teeny weeny amount of stool, and a negative test result may not mean anything. Wet smears, however, are most useful for diarrheic stool because this will demonstrate 
the trophozoites that are moving, amoebae, jarja, and the like. So therefore, pediatricians, no, in the end, you decide. You get a negative test result, you decide whether to treat or not to treat. The best diagnostic test for helmet infections in the clinical setting is the catothic smear, which examines 40 to 50 milligrams of feces. So see the difference? 1 to 2 milligrams versus 40 to 50 milligrams. In parasitology, we say more stool examined, greater chances of catching a true infection. Parang raffle. The more entries you send, the greater chances of winning. And the problem of low intensity infections. In one whole slide, there's only one or two eggs. And a not so good med tech having difficult time, too busy, probably missing the one to two eggs, in, and the result is negative. Unfertilized ascaris eggs. I don't. I wonder if you remember how this looked like. They are misdiagnosed often as artifacts because they look like poo poo. Schisto eggs. I made this mistake when I was a young faculty member at UP. Schisto eggs misdiagnosed as hookworm eggs. What is the treatment for hookworm? What is the treatment for schisto? And other parasites missed, missed emerging parasitosis, uh, minute intestinal flukes seen in southern Philippines, uh, and, and together with a capillariasis epidemic some years ago, uh, was actually the subject of reports from the medtech saying, we have seen those eggs many, many times before we thought they were artifacts. Nobody cares about how stool examination is done. No, no authority cares. And therefore, these labs just function and the misdiagnosis abounds. And then there is, no there is a lack of a national quality assurance program that is implemented on a continuous scale that actually tries to ensure good diagnosis for our parasitic infections. So how big is this problem of common worm infections? The baseline studies done in UP showed 66% of preschool children 67% of school age children para nag-usap. No, this was 2006, baseline preschool children, less than five, 66%. This, is a, uh, this, is, this was a nationwide study supported by DOH, and among school age children, it was 67%. Para nga nag-usap eh, sa preschool 66, sa school age 67. It does not matter, therefore, whether one is preschool or school age, because the infection rates are high. Note that the WHO target is 20%, less than 20%, and therefore our baseline was very bad, no? 66, 67%. How are we doing? The last Sentinel survey we did was 2009. It's down to 44% for preschool and 45% for school age. Again, parang nag-uusap, preschool and school age, hindi tayo magkaiba. No? But see, is that acceptable? A 44, 45% infection rate in Sentinel sites no, because the, the target of the WHO should be just a minority of children infected, and that should be less than 20%. So translating the figures, 44-45% of 30 million children that exist in the Philippines, it's roughly about 14 million children infected with worms. And that, is that, it, and that does not jibe with what we call a, a country with an excellent economy, the best economy in Southeast Asia, but still children are wormy. How about the other age groups, adolescent females? Are you concerned about adolescent females? Yes, they belong to the pediatric age group. A study done later, you know, following 2009, 2011, again commissioned work by DOH shows 30%, one out of three, and pregnant women, 32%, focused on adolescent females. Infection rates range from 13 to 62%. 62%? It's, it's close to the baseline in 2006. And note that the WHO target is again 20%. One interesting thing, the area that had a consistently high infection rate in terms of adolescent females and pregnant women, it was in Region 8, the Yolanda stricken areas around Leyte. And Leyte belongs to the region which incidentally is second to the last in terms of social economic development. Poverty index there is second from the bottom. And therefore, where poverty exists, expect a lot of parasites. Imagine 60% of adolescent children, adolescent females infected, and 76% of 
of pregnant women infected. Not acceptable. Oh, I know that you have many patients coming from the private school. What's the data coming from the private school? There's only one study published in the literature. 14%, I think the lesson here is none of the private schools examined in Quezon City and Taguig. I can tell you the name of the schools later on. I don't wish to, uh, to announce in public because some of this might be your alma mater. No? From 4 to 32 percent, none of the schools had a zero prevalence. May isang school, 32 percent. Akala mo pinag-uusapan public school. 32 percent is more than 20 percent. So private school children are not spared from these infections. Let's go to Shisto. Okay. Uso pa ba ang Shisto? Sabi ng ibang doktor, uso pa ba yan? Eh, mayroon pa nga namamatay eh. Who among you are coming from Visayas and Mindanao? Oh, you go to Leyte, you go to Samar, go to Agusan, Bukidnon, Compostela Valley, Davao, Surigao. You, you mentioned the term S-I-S-T-O, Sisto. You will meet somebody there who says, iyan ang kinamatay ng asawa ko, iyan ang kinamatay ng uncle ko, iyan ang kinamatay ng cousin ko, iyan ang kinamatay ng best friend ko, iyan ang kinamatay ng kapitbahay ko. Ah, para bang normal na may namamatay? And that's not acceptable. Shisto is an old, old disease, easily treated with your prasequantel. There are challenges with diagnostics. Kaya nga lang, mass treatment na nga ang ginagawa ngayon eh. So therefore, wala na nga dapat namamatay because of shisto. Any death due to shisto reflects the failure of the public health system to arrest no, mortalities due to shisto. Problem. Philippines talks about, DOH talks about schistosomiasis Elimination program, patay. Elimination, what have we done with the animals? The carabaos, the dogs, the pigs, that harbor schisto as well, that contribute to the schisto load of the community, that actually, actually have worms that then pass on to people as well. And therefore, I caution them. No? Let's not call it elimination. Maybe just say control. Because when you say elimination, we have high hopes. We are going to wipe it out. Oh, bad news. We belong to the top three. Shisto Japonicum, Philippines is number two, second to China. In China, a recent development, reports say China has done a good job controlling Shisto. So I worry. Ma'am, what happens if you're first runner up and Miss Universe abdicates her throne? The first runner up becomes Miss Universe. So I'm, I'm really afraid to look at the figures now. If this data is updated, I suspect we are now number one. Which universe? <laughs> okay, because of a dethroned China. And again, shameful. Nakakaya. Kaya nga dapat dito magtulungan-tulungan na tayo eh. Kasi nga, ang tagal na nito, tinuro na ng teacher natin, tinuro na ng teacher ng teacher natin, ngayon tinuturo pa natin. Eh, huwag niyo sabihin sa akin, yung mga tinuturoan natin ngayon, ituturo pa nila uli yun sa next generation. That these three generations have failed. That's why I'm teaching you again. The challenge is secondary to Shisto. Alright. Some of the figures, take a look at that. The more red, the more dangerous for Shisto. Okay. Note, newly described provinces. Yung mga inaral natin sa school, sa medical school, na minemorize natin yung mga endemic provinces, kulang na yun. Dagdagan na ninyo yan ng Cagayan province doon sa norte. Uh, pinakamainit daw doon pag summer, pinakamalamig pagka hindi summer. At nandun din may sisto. May namamatay? Meron. Uh, baba sa Negros, aka, who would have ever thought that in Sugarlandia, there would be pockets of rice fields that harbored oncomelania. Remember the oncomelania? Mukhang rice grain. Deadly pala yun. Uh, and there were many, many children, very high prevalence of schisto death. Take a look at that. 6.8 in a place called Calatrava. What is the ideal co uh, prevalence? According to WHO, it should be only less than 1%. Eh, bay nakakamatay itong sakit na ito eh. Eh, bakit ito sa Calatrava, 6.8%? I'm talking about children. Surigao, 5%. Well, one of the most uh, dreaded places I saw, Agusan del Sur, where up to 70% of children in the Barangay Elementary School, public school, may have shisto just by kato cuts alone. What is the sensitivity of the kato cuts for shisto? It is a low 60%. 
And therefore, if you already get a 70% with just your Kato cuts technique, the, the infection rate is probably 100%. Can, can you imagine a place? You go to a school and everybody there is infected, including the teachers. Oh, sabi ko sa inyo eh. So, promising, mukhang kailangan tayo magkatulungan dito. Let's talk about treatment. Malapit na ang oras ko. Okay. Not much new in terms of treatment for common worms. Your best drugs are still albendazole or mebendazole because they are most broad spectrum, more, more acceptable, more safe, very low incidence of adverse events. They can target more than one type of common worm. Albendazole 400 single dose, mebendazole 500 single dose. And incidentally, these are the same drugs used for mass drug administration. Safe, effective, candy-flavored, chewable, prevent deworming tablets. Hindi ka tulad ng araw, mapapait ang pampurga. O kailangan malaking tabletang pangit ang lasa. Ngayon, candy-flavored, chewable tablets. In the Philippines, the protocol is mass treatment two times a year because we had a baseline prevalence of more than 50%. Not sure who among you still use antihistamine with deworming? There is no scientific basis. You go out to the provinces, certain regions, talagang there are municipal health officers or private practitioners who are fond of giving antihistamine. Of course, I've investigated, why do you give antihistamine? I am so intrigued. I was not taught that in med school. I have not read that at all in any of the literature. So ang sagot nila, they want thou to quote-unquote sedate the worm. Why? Is the worm anxious, depressed? You want to sedate? Maybe you have to give the sedative to the physician. <laughs> okay. Now, the other group of doctors I interviewed, sa bandang Mindanao eh, I forgot which area. Why do you give antihistamine? Oh, we were taught this by our, teach, our professor in this school. I will not tell you what school again. Because I keep on hearing certain schools. Tinuturo doon sa school na yon, no? Of course, if you're interested to know what schools, I'll tell you later on again. Okay. So why do you give antihistamine? Because we want to put the worm to sleep. Why? Is the worm experiencing insomnia? That you have to put the worm to sleep? Of course, they're so afraid about the worm passing out through the mouth, which actually is somewhat normal. The worm is naturally erratic in behavior. Diba? It comes out in the board. Which of the following worms has erratic behavior? Ask Chris. So to try to alter worm nature, I think it's beyond our concern. Just accept it. As you accept that there is a day and there is a night and there are stormy days and nights. No? You're protected with the cough and gag reflex anyway. You just warn the mother and the patient or the teacher or the health worker who actually gives the drug. If it happens, don't be surprised. It, it, it happens. Okay? So antihistamines, no role. Prasequantel, 40 to 60 milligrams for Shisto. If you're interested uh, about more details, Clinical Practice Guidelines, Department of Health has developed that through the University of the Philippines in very nice systematic review that should be shared with PIDSP. It was spearheaded by the Clinical Epidemiology Group of uh, UP College of Medicine. The document is going to be put in the press and is going to be uh, distributed to all physicians working in government in all endemic areas in the Philippines. Um, side effects, physician, even physicians are afraid of side effects. Uh, generally mild and transient adverse effects related, those, uh, related to those and related to intensity. The first time you give prasequantel to a child who has heavy intensity infection, expect a lot of adverse events. But over time, when you have given the drug over one or two years, no more side effects or adverse events. The experts also say that the adverse events following treatment with prasequantel in a patient with schisto may be a sign that the drug is taking effect. And therefore, that is a good sign. The drug is taking effect. Most likely, the child we have treated on a ma in a mass treatment campaign is infected. You just deal with the side effects as necessary with symptomatic management. Okay, so what is the goal now? According to WHO, World Health Assembly says, the best means of reducing mortality and morbidity, improving health and development in infected communities is regular treatment of high-risk groups. No need for stool exam anymore. Okay? Particularly school-aged children. 
Access to single-dose drugs, good news. Department of Health buys all the drugs needed by all children in the Philippines, both preschool and school-aged children. Now, this must be complemented by the simultaneous implementation of plans for basis, basic sanitation and adequate supply of safe water, which often is neglected. No? Lip service yan, mga politiko. Oh, napadala na ako ng toilet. Meron na ako kaming ginagawang ito. May poso na ho doon. Kulang lahat yun. Okay. Just uh, one last note about the treatment. There is an oversupply of drugs and mainly because the coverage rate is low. What is the national coverage? National coverage is just 19%. 1-9% when all the drugs are already purchased for all the children in the whole Philippines. So you can imagine the excess of drugs available. Implementation is poor. So preventive chemotherapy is what we're talking about. May kausap ako noon eh. Pwede bang palitan niyo pangalan? Sabi ko, bakit? Kasi preventive chemotherapy parang cancer eh. Ginagamot eh. Hindi naman ako nag-invento niyan eh. World Health Organization niyan eh. It's the use of antihelmintic drugs either alone or a combination as a public health tool against helmet infections. The aim is morbidity control. The best way to go, school-based teacher-assisted MDA, teachers delivering drugs safely, increasing coverage. In co-endemic areas, it is now proven, and the publication is going to come out very soon, albendazole prasequantel given as a cocktail in the classroom. I think I will need to end very soon. If you're interested, take a look at the WHO website, type preventive chemotherapy. Patok na patok yan for Philippines. Bakit? The three parasitic conditions described there we have here in the Philippines. No? Oh, just a message for pediatricians. Don't be a reason why parents refuse that their children undergo mass drug administration in the school. Okay? We have investigated. Bakit ayaw niyo bigyan ng consent ng anak niyo? Sabi ho ng pedya namin eh. Hindi naman daw ho na examine. Ba't na yung pagagamot? Oh, meron pa silang mga haka-haka. Wala naman daw lumabas. Bakit? Microscopic ba mata mo? Oh. Ba't ayaw mo nang paggamot ng anak mo? Last year pinagamot mo. Nag-side effect eh. May lumabas na bulati sa bibig. Eh ano ngayon? Nangyayari naman talaga yun. Oh, itong question mark, hindi ko talaga mapaliwanag hanggang ngayon. Ba't di mo pinayagan yung anak mo? Kasi umuulan. Ba't di mo pinayagan ang anak mo? Kasi bilog ang buwan. May bandang kapis antika namin narinig yung bilog ang buwan. No? So, interpret as you wish. Oh. Ancillary benefits. No? Patok ang preventive chemotherapy, HIV infection, acceleration to 